I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hey, Tommy. How about you come sit down and we'll chat for a while? What's bothering you, Mark? Oh, nothing. I saw your movie The Room the other day and... Yeah. I think you might be an alien. What makes you say that? Well, y your accent, your weird performance, all those mood swings. It's like you're not even from this planet, Tommy. <laughs> What a story, Mark. Yeah, you're definitely an alien. And this is Movie Night! Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth film reviews in five minutes or less. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. Tonight, as we conclude the show's fifth season, we'll be taking another look at some of the crappiest movies ever made. I consulted Wikipedia's list of films considered the worst and picked out some interesting and terrible sounding examples from across the decades. We'll begin with the oldest of the bunch, Plan 9 from Outer Space. Produced on a budget of $60,000, this campy science fiction horror film from notoriously awful director Ed Wood saw limited general release in July of 1959, where it languished in obscurity for almost 20 years until authors Michael and Harry Medved dubbed it the worst movie ever made. Originally titled Grave Robbers from Outer Space, the bizarre film opens with a curious fourth wall breaking introduction by the amazing Chris Well, a well-known and flamboyant psychic from the 1950s who continually addresses the audience as my friend. The weird and unique plot follows a group of citizens from a small town that finds its dead being resurrected by invading aliens in an effort to stop humanity from developing a powerful bomb. In a recording discovered by the American military, the orbiting alien commander humorously remarks, how could any race be so stupid? Did you hear anything? I thought I did. Don't like hearing noises, especially when there ain't supposed to be any. Yeah, sort of spooky-like. Maybe we're getting old. Whatever it is, it's gone now. That's the best thing for us, too. Gone. Yeah, let's go. The unrated film incorporates an insulting posthumous appearance by the original Dracula himself, Bela Lugosi, who was included in the film by way of random silent footage shot years earlier for an entirely different film. His inclusion here and his promotional billing is so brazenly misleading I'm amazed Wood got away with such a cheap ploy, especially since Lugosi's integration into the script is so pointless and cobbled together. Beneath the irritating and unnecessary narration from Criswell, we're witnessed a clumsy and overt exposition that routinely brings the story to a grinding halt. On par with a first year student film project, the picture features blatant production mistakes, cheap props, and rigid editing. Wood's boring and unmotivated direction doesn't help either. Every actor delivers their lines with the energy and urgency of a cardboard box. His definition of a well-framed close-up sees the actors from only waist high. 55 years old or not, the special effects here are downright embarrassing. As the Red Hot Chili Peppers once famously sang, space may be the final frontier, but it's made in a Hollywood basement. And in the case of Plan 9, it really looks like it. Couple that with some really unforgivable lighting inconsistencies and you're left with a technically inept experience on how not to produce a motion picture. The loud and sporadic amateur sounding music and sound effects, like roaring wind and the vacuum of space, don't help much either. There is, however, a somewhat coherent sequence of events and some almost interesting concepts in a film that thankfully is only 79 minutes long. The moral of the story is ultimately nothing more than a thinly veiled protest against nuclear proliferation with goofy costumes and hokey effects. Like some disgusting Ripley's Believe It or Not exhibit, this movie is amusing only as a curiosity, so awful that you're unable to look away. At least the first time, anyway. Plan 9 from Outer Space. Dreadfully incompetent production. Famously bad. Let's see what you had to say about this Ed Wood movie in the YouTube comments. Plan 9 from Outer Space, a 1 and a 2. Lamenting the bad effects, acting, and sets, you found no reason to spare this film from the lowest score, ranking it a garbage. There's an undeniable quaintness to this picture, and Wood's passion for filmmaking somehow resonates despite his many missteps. And when you consider the time in which it was made, is it really a total failure? I'll be slightly more forgiving and only score this a bad. For tonight's poll question, what's your favorite bad movie? Leave your response as a comment below with the hashtag poll question. Next up tonight, let's review the Garbage Pail Kids movie. 
This Rod Amatow adventure comedy film somehow managed to squeak out a profit of $500,000 above its $1 million budget when it was released in August of 1987. Shamelessly and foolishly based on the then popular series of children's gross and weird trading cards, this live action adaptation is perhaps the stupidest product tie in in the long and pathetic history of Hollywood adaptations. Seriously, this PG rated movie was co produced by a freaking chewing gum company. The ramshackle and nonsensical plot follows Mackenzie Austin of The Facts of Life fame as a dweeby and horny teen who accidentally uncovers seven disgusting mutant baby creatures who live in a garbage pail inside an antique store for some reason. Compared to his untalented co stars, Aston actually does a halfway decent job with some of the poorly written material, but honestly, not even an impeccable performance from Daniel Day Lewis could save this shit show. Betrayed with hammy acting by a set tuplet of dwarf actors, these kids kids robotically waddle around the cheap looking sets, constantly spewing out stupid puns, bad jokes, and grotesque fluids from their bodies. The rubberized freak show of midgets can't even execute a good fart joke correctly. Every line of dialogue they utter is eye-rolling and cringeworthy, especially when they break into the picture's lone musical number for no reason. Their facial expressions were reportedly going to be enhanced and finished with post-production animation, but due to budget and scheduling limitations, these elements were never completed, resulting in some positively creepy, undead-looking, four-foot-tall doll figures with frozen mouths and hilariously oversized heads. Austin takes advantage of the misplaced kindness of the Garbage Pail Kids to help win the affection of Katie Barbary, an older girl he has the hots for. But why he's ever attracted to this mess of a human is beyond me. She's shown to be nothing more than a manipulative and inconsiderate jerk with poor fashion sense who constantly exploits her so-called friends. Speaking of fashion, a fair deal of the idiotic plot revolves around black market clothing sales, which only serves to remind modern audiences of how dreadful and ridiculous 80s fashions were. The film is backed by a painfully distracting score from Michael Lloyd that sounds like the music to a jazzercise workout. And in the meantime, you guys could... Getting started with the stuff for the fashion show! Come on, guys, please. Can you, please, can you do it for me, please? All right, we'll do it! All right! But if you don't check out the hole for the ugly... There'll be a ton of garbage on your head! And Dodge, if you pink out on us... I wouldn't want to be your toes. <laughs> An attempt to impart some ethical values concerning outward appearances and treating others fairly is entirely lost in the insulting, crude, and distasteful script that frequently practices the exact opposite of what it is trying to preach. Over the course of the 97-minute experience, you can practically feel your intelligence diminish in real time. The lone highlight of the picture, however, is Anthony Newell as a sage and mysterious mentor character who shares this apropos line of advice towards the beginning of the film. Losing his relative, my dear boy. What matters is conceding with grace. Unfortunately, this slowly paced crap fest ignores its own advice and fails to concede at all, instead going full tilt towards the absurd unashamedly. It's one sad, never-ending gag that goes from unfunny to insufferable, with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. While it deserves its place upon the pantheon of terrible films, it is hardly the absolute worst ever made, but that doesn't mean I'll ever try watching this again. The Garbage Pail Kids movie, a colossal mistake of corporate greed. Now let's see what you had to say in the YouTube comments. No surprises here, a double one for the Garbage Pail Kids movie. A film that the nostalgia critic once called the Holocaust of Cinema, this movie is truly awful, through and through, with none of you mentioning anything positive. A whopping 75% of all who voted rated it a garbage. Although I was slightly less critical and wouldn't even put this in my bottom five, it is quite terrible and does deserve its spot on the lowest rung. I thought it was garbage too. Now, my review for The Room. Written, directed, produced, and starring the weird and mysterious Tommy Wiseau, this shoddy excuse for a romantic drama film was shown in a limited number of California theaters in the summer of 2003. Independently financed on an astronomically inflated budget of six million, the film failed to earn back even 2,000 during its initial run. The lumbering 99-minute story focuses on a nonsensical love triangle between Wiseau, Juliet Danielle, and Greg Sestero, with mostly all the action taking place in two small, badly decorated sets. The dilemma faced by this unmotivated adultery feels like a rejected concept for a lifetime movie. Why So is featured front and center as a bizarre, depressing loser whose curious accent and piss-poor acting single-handedly ruin every moment the film attempts to craft. Besides appearing decades older than his 20-something co-stars, the European protagonist often laughs at inappropriate moments, exhibits wild mood swings, and begins nearly every greeting by saying, oh hi! Unable to remember his lines that he himself wrote, much of his dialogue was sloppily dubbed in post, the resulting performance so indescribably bizarre 
bizarre. It's like an alien masquerading in human form, unfamiliar with our nuanced Earth customs. Suffice it to say, casting himself in the lead was an insurmountable misstep, and the single worst acting performance in the history of cinema. The story is so horrendously written, you begin to wonder if this screenplay was a result of that age-old riddle involving a thousand typewriting monkeys. There's a number of irrelevant non-sequiturs as well, like a now cult favorite scene where the guys throw a football around an alleyway wearing tuxedos for no discernible reason. The haphazardly delivered and unrealistic dialogue is bad enough to make you want to scoop out your own eardrums with a spoon. But even with a flawless script, the loathsome acting here immediately sinks any chance this movie had at succeeding. Danielle might be sexy eye candy, but her inclusion some of the cheesiest love scenes imaginable won't even get the horniest teens aroused. Later, she attempts to defend her cheating habits by saying, you have to live, live, live. Sestero appears to be the only one in the group aware of the disaster they're producing, but being the fastest snail in a group still doesn't make you quick. Years later, he actually wrote a book discussing his turbulent experiences making the film, which was recently optioned by Seth Rogen's company for a film adaptation. Women change their minds all the time. <laughs> You must be kidding, aren't you? Look, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to go upstairs and wash up and go to bed. How dare you talk to me like that? You should tell me everything. I can't talk right now. Why, Lisa? Why, Lisa? Please talk to me, please! You're part of my life. You are everything. I could not go on without you, Lisa. You're scaring me. You are lying. I never hit you. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Why are you so hysterical? Do you understand life? Do you? The story is also rife with inconsistencies and plot holes, not the least of which are threads involving breast cancer and a loan shark debt, which are completely abandoned as soon as they're introduced. The background music might as well be a cheap demo track built into a child's keyboard, because it sounds just as bad. From a technical standpoint, Wiseau isn't entirely incompetent. Most of the scenes are decently lit and adequately framed, but he tends to go overboard with foreground cluttered tracking shots. Hilariously though, Wiseau was not familiar with the difference between film and video, and ended up shooting the entire movie on both formats simultaneously, at a ridiculously unnecessary expense. The R-rated mess is ostensibly nothing more than a poorly constructed, non-erotic, softcore porno that repeatedly repeats itself. Seriously, Danielle shares near-identical dialogue with her mother in three separate scenes. The film Entertainment Weekly famously dubbed the Citizen Kane of Bad Movies was promoted by Weissau with a single billboard on Highland Avenue in Los Angeles at a cost of $5,000 a month for five full years. If I had a guess, I'd say Weissau was burned by an ex-lover early in life and produced this entire mistake of a film as some sort of therapeutic revenge. The unfortunate result is an illustration of the dangers of an unfettered and misguided dream. Only seldom and unintentionally entertaining, this is a dreadful experience I hope I never have to see again. The Room, a horrendous auteur's regretful disaster. Now let's see what you had to say in the YouTube comments. Here's our ratings for The Room, a 2 and a 1. While you were justifiably critical of this picture, you also found a great deal of amusement out of it, and rated it only a bad. Laughable train wreck or not, it's still a train wreck. There's nothing really redeeming here, I thought it was garbage. A reminder now to check out the Movie Night Archive for an organized collection of all our reviews, and to hear my thoughts on upcoming movies. This week I gushed about the new Expendables 3 trailer. Our fourth review tonight will be for The Haughty and the Naughty. Capitalizing on the then enigmatic fame of lead actress and celebrity socialite Paris Hilton, this $9 million gross-out rom-com was released nationwide in February of 2008, where it pulled in a pathetic $1.5 million in proceeds. Directed by Tom Putnam, the PG-13 rated story follows Joel David Moore as a hapless loser who travels to Santa Monica, California to reconnect with his elementary school crush, but is disheartened to discover he must find a date for her hideous best friend first. Step by Step's Christine Lacken plays the naughty character, whose physical issues are entirely superficial, and as the plot rolls on, we find out just how easily correctable they all were. She poignantly laments on her lonely existence by remarking, knowing what you are is also knowing what you're not. While I hesitate to call Hilton an actress, her performance here does what it needs to and remains somewhat realistic, especially when she's required to bat an eyelash or two. The girl knows how to play the town flirt like nobody else. Ultimately though, the entire premise of this stupid 91 minute plot fails to work for one simple reason. Lacken is a more attractive woman than Hilton any day of the week. For a movie that literally rests on the attractiveness of its star, it's an unforgivable misstep. But despite the ridiculous, shallow, and misogynist conditions of the plot, the narrative is actually well-structured and decently paced. And I gotta tell you, I am sickened 
by the fact that none of these narrow-minded assholes can see how beautiful she is, you know, just because they can't get past a few infected toenails and some back knee, you know? I, I know. I feel the same way. Yeah? And I think that I have found the perfect guy for her. What's his name? I, his name is... Uh, Cole Slawson. Cole Slawson, a good friend. Playing out like one long and broken mad TV sketch, the film is nothing more than one pathetic and predictable gross-out trope after another. When one of Lacken's infected toenails chips off and lands in some poor guy's mouth, the reaction induced is more of a gag reflex than laughter. Which is why I'm embarrassed to report I actually did chuckle once or twice during this otherwise repugnant film. The ending of the movie is particularly trite, with dialogue even telegraphing its own cliched ending. Beauty is only skin deep is obviously the film's primary message, but it abandons the core principle of this concept by giving Lacken a physical makeover before film's end, completely diminishing any impact this shameless movie could have had. The traditional cinematography makes good use of its Pacific Coast locale, while David E. Russo's score is relatively unnoticeable. Although it often hovers near the number one spot on IMDb's notorious bottom 100 list, the picture is far from awful, feeling almost sweet at times. Had it not been for a few big mistakes and a stronger cast, the film might have just been forgotten in a of mediocrity instead of being vilified for its unpopular leading lady. And while it may be better than its reputation, that's not saying much, and the movie is best if avoided. The Haughty and the Naughty. Distasteful premise, boring and predictable. Here are some YouTube comments with your thoughts on the picture. Our scores now on the rate a 2 and a 3. You criticized the film for being degrading and mean-spirited, but admitted it wasn't totally terrible. You rated it a bad. For a film that is reportedly one of the worst of all time, I went into this picture with extremely low expectations, and left feeling almost robbed. The movie is dumb, insulting, and unfunny, but never unwatchably so. I thought it was lame. Finally tonight, let's suffer through Movie 43. The motion picture Richard Roper called the Citizen Kane of Awful was produced over several years on a budget of $6 million, and it somehow earned back five times that amount when it was released nationwide on January 25th, 2013. This absurd comedy farce is comprised of a dozen completely separate, disconnected short films tied together with a loose and irrelevant wraparound plot that remarks on the film within a film as the one movie that can bring down society as we know it. Don't get me wrong, this picture is a true sideshow of stupidity and obnoxious material, but it thankfully isn't quite society destroying. The 12 separate live-action shorts each have a unique director, with accomplished individuals like James Gunn, Brett Ratner, and Peter Farley amongst them. For reasons known but to God, a host of otherwise talented, A-list celebrities signed on to this despicable excuse for a movie, and the mammoth cast includes Kate Winslet, Hugh Jackman, Liev Schreiber, Naomi Watts, Anna Faris, Chris Pratt, J.B. Smoove, Kieran Culkin, Emma Stone, Richard Gere, Kate Bosworth, Asif Manvi, Jack McBriar, Justin Long, Jason Sudeikis, John Hodgman, Uma Thurman, Kristen Bell, Leslie Bibb, Chloe Grace Moretz, Christopher Mintz Plaza, Patrick Warburton, Matt Walsh, Johnny Knoxville, Sean William Scott, Gerard Butler, Stephen Merchant, Halle Berry, Terrence Howard, Elizabeth Banks, and Josh Duhamel, all of whom receive a small but equal amount of screen time. The ratio of capable actors to terrible performances is truly astonishing, with every line sounding like it was phoned in. I will spare you the details of this ridiculous disaster, but the entire first segment sees Jackman with unsightly testicles hanging from his face for no reason at all, in a seven-minute sketch that is about eight minutes too long. Another central joke involves around a prop medicine called Poop Viagra, which is precisely when audiences realize they're in for a particularly crappy time. Pun intended. Indeed, the entire 94-minute experience is a never-ending string of painfully unfunny sketches that all overstay their welcome. The fact that actual Oscar-winning actresses were employed in this pile of garbage simply adds insult to injury. You look like you bathed in a dumpster behind the abortion clinic. You look like the kid who got cancer for Christmas. You look like the slutty one on the Golden Girls. Dorothy. Blanche. You take that back! You son of a bitch! You take it back! You take that back! I want to taste you. I want to lick you till you weep. How's your acid reflux? How's your HPV? It's your HPV, Veronica. I'm just carrying it. Let's not have another chicken or the egg debate, Neil. No. Let's. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. Chicken. Egg. 
The R-rated movie is often vulgar, racist, sexist, and embarrassingly immature, seemingly written by a 10-year-old boy who just discovered 4chan for the first time. Technically speaking, the movie is put together like a used Ford Pinto. Barely functional, but it gets the job done. To pad its already drawn-out runtime, the film's credits begin rolling with 17 full minutes left on the clock, only to cut away to another unnecessary sketch just when you thought it was over and couldn't get any worse. There's never any interesting ideas or resolution, just a collection of immature bullshit that attempts to suggest famous people are funny just by virtue of their appearance in such a stupid script. I fear for those people who genuinely enjoyed this picture, as their intelligence and sense of humor can only be classified as a mental imbalance. This is an irredeemable waste of time that is as repugnant as it is pointless. Movie 43, Celebrities Wasted in Shameful Atrocity. That was my scathing review, now let's read six of yours. Movie 43 in the rate a double one. Well, atrocious seemed to be the word of the day, with many of you calling this picture bad, tasteless, pathetic, dim-witted, and wasteful. You ranked it a garbage. I completely agree. This picture is truly dreadful in every respect, and given the people involved, especially painful to watch. I thought it was garbage, too. Finally, tonight, for the last time this season, let's take a look at some of your tweet critiques to see what you're saying about films currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review at the JPMN hashtag as we continue our ongoing conversation about film during the summer. Although I took some breaks along the way to maintain my sanity, season 5 of Movie Night was my most productive yet, with 113 separate reviews across 32 episodes. Following a renovation of Man's Chinese Theater itself, the show was also tweaked and improved along the way, with slicker graphics, improved title cards, a change in editing style that featured much more screen time for myself, new poster backgrounds for all the comment screens, an insight graphic to conclude each episode, and of course my cold open sketches, which are becoming increasingly more involved and creative. It takes a lot of time to produce this show each week, so hopefully you agree that all these changes have made the show even better. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please share any suggestions for improvement in the comments below. I appreciate the feedback and will be reading them all. For me, it's time to take a much needed break. But fear not, the show's annual summer hiatus will be interrupted about once a month for some special episodes I already have planned, when I review some awful mockbusters, box office bombs, and my favorite spoof comedies. And of course, season 6 will return in full force around Halloween. In the meantime, stay tuned to this channel for lots of great content, including some more comedy sketches, an episode of Microwave This, and the return of some older Jog Wheel shows. But if you'd like to watch more Movie Night reviews, check out the related videos on the right, or click subscribe to be notified of all new content. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates between episodes. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next season, have a good movie night.